Hi, everyone. Um, so this is the lecture that's going to deal with service and settlements. Um, and so this is an important topic because it tells us how cities, um, we, last week we covered how cities were created, not really created, but where people are put in cities per city models. Um, and this week we're going to talk just a little bit about what rank size rule is, how cities came about, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and also it'll help you if you are a business person, this is going to talk a little bit about important terminology on where businesses are typically located um, in these services and settlements. Okay, um, so that's where the settlement part comes from is the city, the service part comes from the businesses within um, those settlements. Okay, so you'll see here there's a couple additional articles, etc. One important thing is the central place theory article uh, video that you need to watch. Um, and I'm going to dive into a little bit about what this what central theory place theory means um, in this lecture, but you want to make sure you go, of course, go back and watch this video. It talks a little bit about um, data driven. So this talks about that services part where Starbucks are located, why they're located there. And we use GIS to do that. Um, and we look at economic data. So we look at census data. We look at how much money people make, um, what degrees they have to put specific services in specific settlements or areas of settlements. So Dunkin' Donuts does not have the same clientele that Starbucks has. Um, yeah, maybe sometimes they overlap, but typically they are two different demographics. And believe me, these businesses know those demographics because they look at census data um, and they're able to look at that. So if you ever want to know census data, there is, of course, the wonderful U.S. Census website. Um, and you can go on the U.S. Census website and you can look up quick facts about every city um, zip code uh, in the United States. And you can find out the medium income, the medium average uh, education level, of individuals in those areas, the medium house price level. And then you should look at that data and use that data to figure out if you want to own a business, where you should put your business. So you should know, of course, what clientele use your business and that. There's also the rank size and primate city rule. And we're going to talk about this today too. Um, it seems complex, but it's pretty simple when you break it down. And then this is going to talk to us about squatter cities, really important because squatter cities um, are the wave of the future. Unfortunately, cities aren't going to be able to provide services for the amount of population there is worldwide. So, um, and especially with climate change and people having to be pushed into specific areas, um, this may cause the rise of certain cities and they may not be able to accommodate everybody. And then that's what happens where squatter cities are built or these little cities out outside the city, right? And we cannot discount squatter cities. Um, squatter cities have their own economies. They have their own leaders. They sometimes have their own governments. Um, they have their own, sometimes they have their own um, money system, bartering, other things. I mean, squatter cities are real life cities. Yes, they may be put together in a way that we're not used to in terms of cities, but they are. In the United States, we're struggling with homelessness. Um, homeless camps are squatter cities, um, just like other countries have squatter cities. In the United States, we have homeless encampments, which are squatter cities. Um, they run in specific ways. There are leaders of some of those squatter cities. There are resources for those squatter cities. People share items. They barter items. They are cities. Yes, we go in and, of course, remove all those individuals. It doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, but we do have squatter cities. And now we are learning that we need to accommodate these squatter cities, correct? So these homeless encampments in areas like Seattle and other areas are building tiny homes for individuals. Um, and that is embracing the idea that these squatter cities exist and that there unfortunately is a need because of housing prices in the United States for these squatter cities. Um, so there we go. Okay, so I'm going to dive into the PowerPoint real quick um, and we will move along. Okay, so what is a city? Um, and so cities are absolutely important. Um, it is living outside a city can be very inconvenient. So cities are convenient places for people to get all the resources that they need. There are places where people can live, work, play. Um, they can do everything within a small radius or an area. Everything is right within walking distance, um, and it reduces the cost associated with transportation. 
um, and the ability to share those costs for in infrastructure creates what we call agglomeration. Um, and the economies of agglomeration are the fundamental reason for cities. Um, these ideas of clustering things together reduces friction, and friction is that idea of travel, um, et cetera. It reduces that. So it's really important that these areas, they do a lot with money in a small area. So instead of all that money being spread out over enormous areas like the suburbs, everything is spent within a small area. Now, there are a lot of questions about what is a city, okay, in terms of what is a city and how does the trend to define a city. Um, there is a complex criteria um, for defining what urban and rural is and then, of course, what a city actually means, okay? So urban, because there were some overlap and questions about what urban is and what rural is. If something is considered urban, it, ha um, it has to have incorporated itself as a town or city and has a population of at least 2,500 people, okay? Um, it... it requires a minimum population density of a thousand people per square mile. Areas with factories, business, or large airport can be urban even with less residents, okay? Um, it has a certain percentage of surface imperviousness, which means that it's paved over, okay? Um, and it's contiguous, which means people in the suburbs within five miles of the border of a large city are counted as part of the urban region of that city. So Philadelphia is a city, okay? And it includes some of the suburbs are included within that count to make it that urban city atmosphere. Rural is completely different. So rural does not have a population density of 100,000 people per square mile. It does not have factories, businesses, or an airport. Um, it has large open spaces that aren't paved. Um, and typically in rural areas, there are not suburbs that contribute to that little rural area, okay? So it's important for you to understand what that is. Um, and there is a good kind of definition for this in your textbook um, on page 198 through page 199. That can help you as well if you're still a little confused with that terminology. There's also two other really important terms that I want to cover in that site and situation, and that's actually what kind of place cities where they're located. So a lot of times cities were created where there is a very good site or a certain situation. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about these two terms in a second, but cities didn't just pop up, right? People didn't just kind of be drawn to one specific area and live there. There are reasons why cities are located where they're located. In Philadelphia's case, we're right along a river system, which is really important for navigation, for food, for, um, for goods to be transported in and out. Um, it is a little bit in from the ocean, so that's good. Um, some parts of the city are higher, like Chestnut Hill, um, could be an area that was used for defensiveness. Um, but these are all part of the equation on why cities are and where they're located and why they were able to prosper. So a site is those elements that favor the growth of the city that were founded on location. So for example, the availability of water, food, good soils, quality of a harbor. That's why Philadelphia is where it is, right? But there's also other things that determine where cities are. So situation is another example of where, why a city might be where it's located. And that is those external factors. So the city might um, be created because it's a good defense, meaning that it's located in a good area to look for in terms of defensibility. Okay. Um, and that is really important for us to understand the differentiation between that site and situation um, and those defensible site locations. A good example, and I give an example here, the situation of Moscow is an exceptional distance for armies to travel if they want to invade Moscow. So that is why Moscow is their big city or where their state government is located. 
Okay, um, and this is what has helped Moscow um, survive. Um, San Francisco was an example of an American city that was based on defensibility. Um, the location of it by the Pacific Ocean and the Bay um, of San Francisco was established because the military advantage it provided by that site. Okay, so does that help explain a little bit? Hopefully that does help explain a little bit between what site and situation means. Okay, the next thing we're going to move into is central place theory. And central place theory is a theory that was first proposed in the 1930s by German geographer Walter Christaller. Um, and it explains how the most profitable location can be um, identified. Okay, and we use shapes to do this. Okay, so the first term that we need to know when we're talking about central place theory is central place. And what is central place? A central place is the market center where people cluster to buy and sell goods. And we, you probably can sort of not align it the same exact terminology, but central business district is a lot like that central place. Okay, um, and the, the central place would be the little dot in the middle, and then the market area would be what's around the outside of that or the hinterland. It's the central place theory. Um, we draw this. So I'm just going to kind of, I got to show you an image to be able to tell you exactly what that is, right? So this is the central place, and this whole box around it is what we call the market area, okay? And that is the individual's that would use that central place, so that whole market area. And the, sur the threshold, so to determine the extent of that market area, where, who is the farthest person that will come to my business, okay? Um, I need to look at a couple different things. So the first thing that I need to look at is range and threshold. Threshold is the minimum number of people needed to support the service. So that central place needs or business needs to be supported by a specific amount of people. If you don't have a lot of people in your area to support your business, then it's going to go defunct, correct? So you need to make sure that your market area is big enough to encapsulate those individuals who would use your service, okay? Range... So convenience stores, fast food restaurants appeal to nearly everyone, whereas specific other goods and services appeal primarily to a certain consumer group, okay? And in those cases, their market area would probably be larger, right? Because, for example, if you own a Gucci store, right, you, you need to have a larger market area. So that's why there's not a Gucci store on every corner, right? Because your market area has to be larger. Whereas if you have a convenience store, right, your corner store, we can have one on those on every corner because the market area for people who need smaller good items is there, right? Whereas a Gucci item is that you need a larger market area because not everyone can afford one. And it's a niche product or a niche product. It's not something that someone buys every day. So you need to think about those things. OK, um, and then that range area is the distance people are willing to travel to get to that service area. And we want that to be equidistant because if it's different, then it's not equidistant between um, from the service area to the next service area. And I'm going to show you a picture in a second, but I'm going to end here and I'm going to come back with part two.